So we're going to proceed now to the next lecture in the workshop, which is on optimization modeling with LEAP and NEMO. And optimization modeling, as you will see, is a very common technique for energy system modeling and energy system analysis, but it is a rather complicated topic. And so what I'd like to do in this lecture is to begin with some basic background about what optimization modeling is, why it's done, and how it's done. And then we'll look at specifics of how LEAP and NEMO implement optimization and what you can do with optimization in LEAP. So first though, let me start with a bit of background and, um, and motivation for the topic of energy system optimization. We know that energy systems are very complex and that's especially true if you look at a larger geographic scale, like a national scale system. There are many different actors in systems in energy systems and myriad decisions that are made every day about investment, about operations, about what to purchase and how to use it. And energy systems have potentially very complicated and far-reaching impacts and vulnerabilities as well. There are also important physical limits on what can and can't be done in energy systems. And there are human limits in energy systems. In addition, there are, there's inertia in energy systems, for example, due to equipment that has been installed and purchased already. And so if we're trying to simulate an, an energy system, and in particular, if we're trying to do a forward-looking prospective analysis of an energy system to understand the way that it might evolve in the future, it's an inherently difficult task. And it's not immediately clear that there's a single right way of doing this. But if you look at the practice of energy system modeling and the literature around energy system modeling, what you'll find is that there are a few major approaches that have emerged that many practitioners use and that are considered to be reliable and useful. One of these is least cost optimization. The other one is equilibrium modeling, which I'll say more about in a second. But what least cost optimization fundamentally tries to do is it simulates an energy system by trying to meet energy requirements while mi minimizing discounted energy system costs. So in other words, what it's saying is, if we want to imagine the way that an energy system might operate, we, we could imagine that it could operate in a way that minimizes the costs of the system. Those costs typically include the types of costs that I've shown on the left of this slide here. They would include capital, or equipment costs for energy using and producing equipment, operation and maintenance costs, the costs of importing and exporting fuels, potentially salvage values or residual value left over in energy equipment at once it reaches the end of its operational lifetime. That might also include externality costs. Typically in cost optimization energy, in energy system cost optimization models, the costs that are used are real costs and they're usually quantified from a social costing perspective, which means that they are the costs that society incurs to run the energy system, not necessarily the costs that are faced by a particular actor in that system, like a power plant operator or a household consumer. Cost optimization models can be run using costs from those other perspectives, and they can offer interesting results, but for the purpose of overall planning, planning what's in the best interest of society, usually it's social costs that are used in cost optimization models. The other major energy system modeling approach that's very frequently used is equilibrium modeling, which envisions that the, the energy system results from the interactions of producers and consumers Producers operate with profit maximizing behavior. Consumers operate with utility maximizing behavior and their interactions are mediated through markets that have prices that can adjust in order to clear the markets and settle the exchange of, of supply and demand. And equilibrium modeling is, is very commonly used, especially for large scale national or even regional or international or global models. 
uh, for example, the integrated assessment models that underlie many of the IPCC's assessment reports for energy systems and greenhouse gas emissions at the global scale. Many of them use equilibrium modeling approaches. Fundamentally, equilibrium modeling approaches make most sense if you believe in the, the neoclassical economic principles that underlie them. They usually tend to be more top-down models that don't describe the physical operation of the energy system in as much detail as you can get with optimization models. But these are two major paradigms for energy system modeling that have emerged. And if you consider what we've been doing with LEAP so far, actually what we've been talking about with LEAP so far doesn't fit really into either of those two categories. Although now we'll talk about how you can do optimization modeling with LEAP. And the types of modeling that we've been talking about are simulation approaches um, that are based, grounded in physical, the physical operation of the energy system but are somewhat simpler approaches that can be used to, um, to assess energy systems as well. And many of them have deep roots in the energy modeling literature, but in terms of the, their, their predominance in, in energy modeling um, analyses today, particularly the analyses that inform international dialogues around energy, the, uh, the optimization and the equilibrium modeling approaches are the most common. Now for optimization modeling, you might ask, well, why, why would anybody think to operate a model of an energy system like this in a least cost fashion? And there are usually a few different arguments that are advanced for it, which I've bulleted out here. One argument is an efficiency argument, meaning that if you're going to use a model for planning purposes, then all other things being equal, you should probably try to come up with a plan that meets your energy requirements in the least costly way. That's the efficient thing to do. Then society can use its other its resources, other resources for other purposes. Another argument that you hear sometimes is that this is the way that a planner would would run the energy system if a planner could. Planners would emphasize efficiency and cost effectiveness. In some cases, it can be reasonable to use an energy op system optimization model to simulate parts of an energy system because it's a, actually a quite reasonable approximation of how some energy markets actually operate. Uh, competitive electricity markets, for example, usually operate on cost minimization principles. And so it could be a rather high fidelity way of analyzing what happens in those markets. And then another important advantage and argument for cost optimization modeling is that it can account for, or it can be quite technologically specific and explicit and thereby account for important physical features of energy technologies, the actual physical limits that technologies have when they're being used to produce or consume energy within the system. But despite all of these arguments, it's inescapable that energy system optimization is a stylized and idealized way of looking at an energy system. In fact, most energy, real world energy systems don't operate as cost optimization models would suggest. There are various distortions or differences. And so the, if you do a projection of an energy system that's based on cost optimization, you end up with an idealized projection, but it might be a useful one. It can be a useful one for some of these reasons that are shown on this slide. And for planning purposes, it, it can often help to set a target that you might want to work toward in your plans because the target shows what could be achievable if you were to minimize the costs of the system. So when people actually write down energy system optimization models, mathematically what's happening is what's sketched here on this slide. These models are put together as a system of equations, system of interlinked equations. And they have at the kind of the top of the pyramid, if you will, an objective function, which is the overall 
objective that the model is trying to solve. And it's usually to minimize the sum of discounted energy system costs. But then that minimization, that cost minimization, happens subject to a number of constraints. And these constraints here are shown through the, the functions that are labeled g of x and h of x. And the constraints take in into account different model variables, which are quantities that the model can determine itself. For example, how much capacity gets built or how capacity is used, what fuels get, cho get chosen to be used. So these, these constraints take into account those model variables, and they may also take into account other exogenous values that affect the way those variables interact, which could be parameters which are, or they're called parameters. They're things like power plant efficiencies or the emission factors that are associated with running a particular technology. And so the objective function is analyzed and it's the, the model attempts to optimize it based on or subject to all of the constraints that the model operates under. Some of the variables may also have upper and lower bounds identified for them. So for example, the production of energy can never be a negative quantity. That might be a, a, a lower bound associated with a particular model var variable. Constraints within energy system optimization models are used to, to simulate physical realities, like operating limits for equipment, and then accounting identities as well. So you might for example, say that the total demand that you have to meet for electricity is the sum of all of the demands, all of the individual demands that you have from energy using equipment, that's just an accounting identity. And they can also then, they are, are, are also used to uh, simulate other rules that you want the optimization to obey. For example, that supply has to be greater than or equal to demand. So you would minimize your costs while obeying or adhering to all of those constraints that are operative on your system. The constraints can be used for other, a variety of other rules as well that have nothing to do with energy adequacy. You can use constraints to specify that emissions are limited to a certain level, for example, or that a certain fraction of the energy production has to be from renewable sources. But fundamentally, all cost optimization models, energy system optimization models, use a formulation that in the abstract is like this one here. Here's a different way you can think about this type of a problem graphically. So this problem, this is a little picture from Wikipedia that imagines a, an optimization program, a simple linear optimization program that only has two variables within it. So the model gets to choose what the values are for those two variables. And what it's trying to do is to minimize costs, let's say, in the direction of the arrow shown attached to this red line here. And so it, within this, this particular graphic, the set of feasible, or the, the lines on the polygon here are constraints. So the model has to operate within this polygon. The set of feasible solutions is in the yellow interior of the polygon. And the optimal solution would be the possible solution that performs best with respect to the objective function, but meets all of the constraints. And so that would be this dot here on the polygon. Of course, real world optimization models for energy systems have thousands or millions of variables and thousands or millions of constraints. So they can't easily be represented as a simple polygon like this, but the concept is the same. The model is searching for an optimum solution within the set of feasible solutions. Now, before we move off of the background information about optimization, I'd like to just say a few more things about different types or major classifications of energy system optimization models. And then I'll talk a little bit about how that mathematical formulation that we were just looking at is typically translated into computer code. At first, some dichotomies to think about, or some uh, typology, I guess, of 
of energy system optimization models. The first pairing that I'd like you to think about is about full energy system optimization versus partial energy system optimization models. Some models and some tools take an entire energy system, both the supply side and the demand side of the energy system, and they try to optimize the entire system. They choose what the demand side technologies are going to be, what the supply side technologies will be, how fuels will be produced to meet the demands. Typically, these models start with some statement of useful energy requirements, the energy services that people need. For example, the energy that actually has to be delivered to air in buildings to cool the buildings, or the passenger kilometers that people need to travel to go about their business. And then given some statement of useful energy requirements, the models go about identifying the least cost configuration of the entire energy system subject to the constraints. So what vehicle technologies do people choose? What, what cooling technologies? How are the input fuel requirements for those technologies met? What, how is electricity generated? How, is, how are petroleum products produced, for example? There are a number of tools out there that support full energy system optimization. The NEMO tool, the Next Energy Modeling System for Optimization, which is a tool that we've made at SEI and which we use with LEAP for optimization modeling, that is one such tool. It can do full energy system optimization, although as you will see in a minute, and when we connect it to LEAP, that capability is not provided within LEAP. So right now there's a more restricted form of optimization that you can do within LEAP. Some other major tools that support full energy system optimization include the times Markel family of models, the message model from IAEA, Homer model, and the osmosis model. And then other tools support partial energy system optimization. And what that means is pretty much what it sounds like. It's just that the optimization is occurring for selected sectors within the energy system, most typically just the electricity production sector. And an example here is LEAP. Actually, as you will see, LEAP, when you use optimization modeling, you can optimize one transformation module at a time. And therefore, you're essentially op optimizing one energy supply sector, like electricity production. And a couple of other tools that do this are WASP and Plexos. They don't take into account all sources of energy supply and demand in their optimization. They're focused on particular sectors. In practice, if you look at the way that most energy system optimization studies are, are conducted, you'll find that most of them focus on optimizing energy supply. And there are a few reasons for this. One reason is data availability and tractability. Usually the energy supply system is more centralized than energy demands. It's easier for modelers and analysts to understand what's going on and to find the data necessary to characterize what's going on in the supply sectors. But it's also true that optimization analyses to the extent that they, they faithfully represent what's actually happening, how actors actually take decisions in the energy system, they're better at doing that for the supply side of the system than for the demand side of the system. It's really not generally the case that consumers on the demand side of the system are taking cost optimal decisions when they choose the vehicles that they buy or how they use the appliances in their home. Usually there are other factors that are much more important, including cultural traditions, the availability of information or lack of information, um, the, the um, barriers potentially to particular technologies being taken up in a market. So, Optimization is usually a little less convincing, at least in my opinion, for demand side analyses. And that I think is part of the reason why a lot of optimization models also focus on the supply side of energy systems. Another distinction I'd like to call to your attention is the distinction between fixed demand and partial equilibrium optimization analyses. So again, it's a dichotomy here. Some, some optimization models, in fact, most, I would say, use a fixed demand approach. And in that approach, what happens is you tell the model what demand is. Demand doesn't depend on supply. 
Now the demand could be for, ener for useful energy or it could be for final energy, depending on the type of model that you have. But fundamentally, the demand at some level is an exogenous input into the model. It doesn't depend on supply and the model is run to figure out what the supply needs to be to meet the demand through optimization. And you can contrast this with a partial equilibrium approach in which the demand is actually subject to a price elasticity and the price depends on the supply solution that's chosen. And a supply demand equilibrium is found through the optimization. Now this type of optimization actually is incorporating some equilibrium principles, which I talked about earlier, in particular that there are competitive markets, profit maximizing firms and utility maximizing consumers. And it's called partial equilibrium because the, the, the equilibrium that's found depends only on the prices induced by the, by the um, production of energy. And it's not a full equilibrium for all goods and services throughout the economy. LEAP itself and, and NEMO are fixed demand models. And that is the most common type of demand modeling that you find in optimization models. And I would just say that partial equilibrium models are, are interesting, but really do, do bear in mind that they only really make sense if you believe in the neoclassical hypotheses that underlie them, particularly those three hypotheses I've bulleted out here. Another distinction between types of, of optimization models is between perfect versus limited foresight models. And so this is about how far into the future the model looks when it's doing its optimization. In a perfect foresight model, the model looks at all years of the planning horizon simultaneously and minimizes the costs simultaneously in all years. So it finds a global, a global optimum global optimum for the cost minimization objective. What this is essentially saying is that a planner that is trying to minimize costs has perfect knowledge of what's going to happen in the future and can find the very best solution for the entire planning period. Another approach that gets used though is limited foresight, which in, in limited foresight, the optimization happens in stages. There are different subsets of the years that are considered. So the first set of years, and usually the intervals are three to five years long, they could be more or less, but an optimization happens for the first interval. The results from that interval provide the starting conditions for the second interval. There's an optimization in the second interval and so on. The argument for limited foresight modeling is that it could better approximate the behavior of actors in a market because usually actors only look out and can only really see a few years into the future. They can't see 30 years into the future. So limited foresight modeling might provide a more realistic simulation. At the same time, it has its drawbacks because if the point of the modeling is to show what could be possible, then it might be better to find a global optimum, which is what you get with perfect foresight. I would say most optimization models are perfect foresight models. Most energy optimization models are and LEAP and NEMO do perfect foresight modeling. And then finally, one other classification of optimization models, which I'd like you to just be aware of so that you can understand in particular how LEAP and NEMO fit into the landscape of models that are out there, is around whether models have a single optimization, a single objective for their optimization or whether they take multiple objectives. So a multiple objective optimization will seek to minimize the costs of the energy system and minimize or maximize some other attributes. For example, minimizing environmental impacts or maximizing energy independence at the same time as costs are minimized. This obviously requires some trading off of the objectives because at some point the objectives may be in conflict. And there are different ways that people use to resolve those trade-offs. 
the three most common approaches are what I've listed here on this slide. One is to weight the objectives. You could say, well, the cost optimi optimization objective is twice as important as energy independence. Another way that people use is to optimize on one primary objective, but to put limits on the allowed values for others. So you could say, for example, well, we want to minimize costs, but emissions can be no higher than X. And then a third, uh, third technique that you find in the literature is something called min-max, which looks for Pareto optimum solutions. So those are solutions where you can't improve one objective without worsening another and then chooses the Pareto optimum solution that is the best, where best is defined as, and it's a little complicated here, but minimizing the maximum deviation from the single objective optimum. So you can look at how far off each Pareto optimum outcome is from what you would get if you just looked at the objectives individually and take the one that minimizes that total distance. Leap and Nemo allow you to do either to do a single objective optimization or to, to optimize one primary objective, but with limits on allowed values for others. So they can take into account multiple, multiple objectives that you might have, um, in particular uh, objectives around, around environmental externalities, so emissions, or objectives around the production of renewable energy. And it's also possible to add other constraints into a Leap Nemo model that would constrain the performance of the system in other areas. So I'd like to just talk for a minute here in the next part about how these concepts of cost minimization and the mathematical formulation that we were looking at, how they actually get translated into a computer model. So first, uh, first concept that is used here is something called a reference energy system. This is a framework that gets used essentially for putting together a computer and optimization model in a, in a computer system for an energy system. It's a way of conceptualizing the structure, the internal structure of an energy system optimization model. Fundamentally, what it is is a network description of an energy system that shows the connections between energy producers and consumers. And it can be represented as a diagram, like what you see on this slide here. So it takes the energy system and it imagines it as a set of nodes or points, where at each point there's some energy production or energy consumption occurring. And then there are lines that connect those nodes and points that define how the energy flows from producers to consumers and who, uh, which which elements of the system are providing energy to which other elements and what transformations are occurring. So you end up with this network diagram. And the, the beauty of this for, for energy system optimization modeling is that it gives you a framework into which you can start to drop technical and cost parameters for the different components of the energy system. It's a, it lends itself to technologically explicit modeling. So essentially, at a high level, what, what is done to create the computer model is you take a network diagram like this and you associate different cost and performance parameters with each part of the diagram and put together a system of equations in a computer system that represents that. In terms of the actual computation, coding and computation of energy system models, there are special purpose software tools that are used to specify the models as a system of equations, linear or nonlinear equations, depending on the types of constraints that are used. These are languages essentially for writing down the mathematical description of a model in a way that a computer can understand. And there are a number of common tools that get used here. GAMS is one, MATLAB, Julia is one. Even Excel can be used for simple linear optimization models. And these tools are used essentially to create that system of equations in a way that a computer can understand it. That they, most of these, most tools that are used for optimization modeling then work in concert with a separate solver program 
which is used to find a solution to that system of equations, if there is one, and not all optimization problems have an actual solution. Um, some, th there are a number of different solvers out there for optimization problems and, and number of solvers that are used for energy system optimization. Some of these solvers are open source and freely available. We've listed a couple out here, the, the GLPK solver and the CBC solver, for example. And then other solvers are proprietary. They require a paid license. But usually they're faster and capable of handling more difficult problems. And we have a few listed out here, for, such as CPLEX and Kurobi. Now we've designed Leap and Nemo as an optimization toolkit to work with all of the solvers that we've listed out here. So a, a fairly large set of solvers, some of which are freely, freely available to our partners, and then some of which are require a paid license but have better performance. And we've, we've done that really because our whole intent behind optimization modeling with Leap and Nemo is to simplify it for users and to offer users options for, for carrying it out. In this case, what solver program to use. When you install Nemo with Leap, as hopefully you've had a chance to do following the instructions and the, the workshop program, you will install automatically then two of the open source two open source solvers, GLPK and CBC. So immediately on installing Leap you can, and Nemo, you can go ahead and start optimization problems and working with optimization. And then if you decide that you want to upgrade to a commercial solver, you can also do that later on and Leap and Nemo will work with them. As a practical matter, I would say for people doing national scale models, the CBC solver, which we ship with Nemo, is good enough to do national scale models. And then with a very complicated model, it could take a while to solve a scenario. And so it's better if you can upgrade to a commercial solver, although some of those commercial solvers are very expensive. So we, we've tried to make at least one option available, the CBC option, which offers good enough performance to be used with national scale optimization models. A few parting thoughts here before I leave the theory of optimization. Just some overall things to consider if you are going to get into optimization modeling. One is around the data requirements for optimization. It, it's true that optimization modeling requires more data than other approaches to energy modeling. For example, if you did trends analysis or simple activity analysis where you used your professional judgment to envision the way that the system might, might evolve in the future, that doesn't require as much input information usually as an optimization model would. For optimization modeling in particular, you need to have costs in your model. You can't do cost optimization modeling without knowing something about capital costs, operation and maintenance costs, fuel costs, and so forth. And you need to have both current and projected values for costs, but also for technical parameters. So there's quite a lot of data that need to be input in order to run an optimization model. You can lessen the data requirements if you have a more aggregated model structure, but that might, that might elide or that might, uh, that might cover over important system dynamics. So, you have, you have decisions to make about whether you want to represent things in a very detailed way in an optimization model or more aggregate way. And there's a trade-off between the amount of time you need to spend on data collection and the types of questions that the model is good, good, good to answer and how appropriately it might be reproducing the actual performance of the underlying system. Another practical consideration is around model sensitivity and the plausibility of models. In fact, if you look at energy system optimization models, many of them are very sensitive to their parameters, to the exogenous inputs that you put in, whether that's the efficiency of a power plant or the cost, the cost of a fuel that's imported into the area or the 
amount of a new technology that's allowed to be added per year. Those are some examples of parameters that a modeler could set. They're exogenously specified. The modeler chooses them. And the model results can be very sensitive to those parameters. Initially, when people build an optimization model and run it, models tend to produce a, a corner solution, which means basically a solution that gravitates toward building one type of technology and using one type of technology predominantly, which stands to reason if the model's purpose is to find the cheapest option and it's a fairly simple configuration, one option will be cheapest, it will use it. But the problem with this is that most people think that type of a solution is not plausible. Well, it doesn't really conform to reality. You know, there's no way that the market would ever develop like that. We're subsidizing other types of technologies, or we won't allow that much of a particular technology to be built. And when a corner solution confronts that type of a reality check, usually what has to happen is the modeler ha has to go back into the model and add constraints until a plausible result is, is attained. And it's that process of adding constraints that in many ways decides the outcome of the model. How much wind are you going to allow the model to build? That's gonna determine to a very large extent what composition, what power mix you have in the final result. And so I think it's important both as a modeler and as, a, as someone who might be looking at the results from an optimization model to understand this underlying process, to understand that it goes on and to, and, and really to try to figure out what constraints have been added or need to be added to arrive at a plausible outcome. Here too, I think, again, transparency is really, really important. If you develop an optimization model, I think it's critical and incumbent on you as a modeler to be very open and transparent about what constraints were implemented and why. And that will help people assess whether the results are reliable. And then a third consideration I would highlight is around model complexity and performance. It's about a trade-off here. Optimization modeling itself is computationally intense. Solving a system of equations with thousands or millions of variables and equations it's difficult and it's why we use computers to do it. There is a trade-off, an important trade-off between how much resolution you have in a model, how much complexity you have in a model and how long it takes to run. So if you choose to have technologies disaggregated in a, in a greater way, if you choose to represent individual plants or individual generating units in a model instead of some higher level grouping. Or if you choose to have a greater number of time slices in the model, so you're looking at, you're dividing the year into an increasing number of intervals, or you add many more supplemental constraints to a model, all of these things will increase the complexity and tend to increase the runtime of the model. And if you decide to build a an optimization model with Leap and Nemo, you're going to find that you'll there, there will be a trade-off in the context of your particular model, and it will be worth exploring what the performance impacts are of increasing or decreasing resolution in different areas. As you do this, it's really important to keep in, in mind a couple of questions that I've shown here. What, what are you trying to do with the model? What questions are you trying to answer with the model? If you need to, to show the impact of electricity system policies on a particular plant or set of plants, then you need to have them separated out in your model. If you want to see what the impact of climate change is on hydropower in a particular region of your country, then you have to have the hydropower capacity in that region of the country distinguished as a separate technology in your model. And you should think also about what, what are the dynamics that affect the questions that you're trying to answer. If it doesn't really matter um, whether, if, if for example, very short-term fluctuations in power output don't really affect the questions that you're trying to answer, then you don't need to have very fine-grained time slices in your model necessarily. 
usually longer term and shorter term optimization models have very different resolutions in them. If you are examining a shorter time horizon, so a smaller number of years, then you can dial up the level of detail in the model. But if you are, have a long-term model, which is making projections out to 2050 or 2060 or beyond, then usually you have, to, you have to accept as a compromise a lower resolution in order to have a reasonable runtime. When we build national scale models with LEAP and NEMO, we have runtimes that vary from a minute or two to a few hours, depending on the, on the resolution that we have in the model and some of the other performance tuning options that we choose. If you want to examine a large number of scenarios in your modeling, then you need to make choices that will lead to a lower runtime or you won't be able to get results in a timely fashion. So that's enough, I think, for background. Now what I'd like to do is talk to you about how we actually implement these concepts in our modeling toolkit within LEAP. And I'm going to start with an overview of what NEMO is, the Next Energy Modeling System for Optimization. So this is a, an open source and high performance energy system optimization tool that we've developed at SEI. And we developed it to integrate with LEAP as its graphical user interface. So you can use NEMO with the command line interface, but it's really designed for you to use it with LEAP. And the reason we developed it was if you've followed the history of LEAP and if you looked closely at the slides in our first lecture on the timeline of LEAP's history, you, you may have seen that we've been actually doing optimization modeling with LEAP for around 10 years now. Initially, when we started doing optimization modeling with LEAP, we paired LEAP with an, with an open source optimization model called Osmosis. This is a model that's developed by a consortium, but it's led by KTH University in Sweden. But the problem we had with Osmosis, we had a few problems with it. One was that it was written in a very old language and difficult to enhance to add features that our partners were requesting like energy storage modeling. And its performance was very poor. So we, we developed NEMO in part as a response to that and have been working with NEMO as our primary optimization module essentially for LEAP since we released it last year. NEMO includes a number of features that are really intended for decarbonization and advanced electricity system analyses like energy storage, the, the uh, modeling of nodal networks within the energy system for power flow and pipeline flow of gas and oil. It has emission and renewable energy targets, carbon and pollutant pricing that it supports uh, and supports modeling of regional or supports regional modeling with LEAP and the modeling of energy trade. We've built it to be compatible with multiple solvers and to have a lot of performance tuning options, which I've already alluded to. Um, among the performance enhanced or capabilities in LEAP is a parallel processing capability, which helps quite a bit with preparing the, the optimization model for passing it over to the solver. And then it also lets you simulate selected years in your modeling period, which can be really helpful if you're working with a sophisticated uh, model, which may take, say, a few hours to solve for a 50-year time horizon. You can instead select to solve only every 10 years, for example, and cut the runtime substantially that way. Since I'm mentioning this feature, I'd like to show you actually where it's enabled, because it's also a feature that can be used in regular LEAP models that have nothing to do with optimization. It's under basic settings and under the years tab. And there's an option here called results every. So by default, when LEAP runs, it's showing you results for every year in your, your time horizon, your planning horizon from the base year to the end year. But if you write, for example, every 10 years, then it will only calculate results for, the, for years that are evenly divisible by 10, so 2010, 2020. And that will speed up the calculation time. And even if you're just doing your calculations with LEAP only, it can be a lot faster to have results for selected years rather than for every year. That option is also used if you were doing modeling with NEMO.
We programmed Nemo itself in Julia, which is a high performance language for mathematical computing. And you can see the code and the documentation online at the links that I've given in the slide here. So because it's open source, the code is freely available for anybody to inspect. And we have good documentation posted as well, which tells you everything that you might want to know about what goes into the model, what comes out of the model, and so forth. And I will say that the Nemo, Nemo development that we do is always a little bit ahead of what Leap supports. So for example, right now, Nemo can support power flow analysis. That capability is not fully integrated with the Leap interface. In that case, actually, there's a separate add-on for Leap that we've developed that can support that, you know, that can allow you to do power flow analysis within your Leap model. And if you're interested in that, I, you, you should follow up with me and I can provide you more information about it. But we're always developing new features in Nemo and they're getting integrated afterward in the Leap interface. So there are some things that Nemo can do that you can't do through the Leap interface, but you can read about them in the documentation. And in many cases, you can activate them as well, whether through an add-on or through a configuration file for Nemo. You can, add, you can activate them in your Leap Nemo model. You've already hopefully had a chance to install Nemo. If you haven't, you can follow the instructions in the workshop program on installation. Here are the basic prerequisites for running Nemo. It can run on any system that's compatible with the Julia language. So that would include Windows, but also other systems like Mac OS. But if you want to use Nemo with Leap, you have to use Windows because Leap is a Windows program. And the, the hardware requirements depend on your model size, but I've listed here what we would advise for most typical models, having a multi-core processor, at least eight gigabytes of RAM and at least 500 megabytes of free disk space. And it's good to have administrator privileges when you install Nemo. There are two ways you can install it, but really for the best performance with Leap, we recommend that you use the installer program that we provide on the Leap website. And that's what you should have used in setting up for this workshop. So you can get to that on the Leap website just by going to the download option when you're logged into the website and you can download the Nemo installation file right there. If you were interested though, you could also install it from source code and there are instructions on how to do that within the Limo, within the Nemo documentation. And I've provided a link to that here. That's really only for advanced users, but it is something that we do, we do offer. And there are some people in our community who have done that and are working with it that way. But what we'll focus on in this workshop is running Nemo from Leap. And so I'm gonna now just outline for you how that actually gets done. And, and you're gonna have a chance to work with this in the second of the two exercises after the workshop today. So we've got one exercise on cost benefit analysis and one on optimization modeling. And in that optimization exercise, you're gonna go through all of these steps as well. As I said earlier, right now, Leap can optimize one transformation module at a time. So this is essentially one supply sector at a time. Even though Nemo would, it does support full energy system optimization, it's not enabled through the Leap interface. So usually people, when they choose to run optimization in a Leap model, they're gonna optimize their electricity production or their electricity generation transformation module. And that the reason for that is that those are usually the most, uh, electricity production is usually the most complex part of the energy supply system. It's also a part where people are really interested in cost optimal results and cost optimization might do a good job of approximating the way the electricity market works. But you can choose to optimize other mod modules if you want to, but there's only, you can only turn on optimization for one module at a time in a model. The way you turn it on is when you are, when you have clicked on a module branch. So for example, electricity generation here, 
there's a new module level variable called optimize that you can use to turn on optimization. And there you can select Nemo and you can select the solver that you want using the synta syntax like here, like what you see here. So this is going to optimize this scenario using Nemo in the CBC solver. Now note this variable is only available in projection scenarios. And so you don't get it in current accounts. Current accounts is never optimized. It's always just reproducing historical data. But for any projection scenario starting in the first scenario year for your model, you can turn on optimization. And because it's a, a, a variable that can vary by scenario, you can have a non-optimized scenario calculated right alongside an optimized scenario. So you can turn on optimization for certain scenarios only and see how those results differ from your non-optimized results. And that is in fact something you'll do in the optimization exercise after the workshop today. Right, so someone has asked a question, I'm pausing here to answer a question that's been asked in the chat. It says, someone has asked, I saw it only Julia in a black background when I opened Julia 153, what's wrong with this? And essentially, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. But what you've done is just start up Julia, a Julia client or a Julia environment, and that would give you a command line um, interface to work with Julia. But there's no need to do that when you use Nemo through Leap. The way to use Nemo through Leap is what I'm showing you on this slide here. When you turn on Nemo optimization modeling through Leap and you click on the results view to see your results, then Leap will run Nemo for you. It will do the optimization and will pull the results back into the results view for you. Someone has asked too whether how you can know or quickly check if you've installed Nemo in Leap. Let me show you that. If you go to the help menu and you go to about leap, you should be able to see right in the first part of the display that comes up, a line that looks like this that says whether you have Nemo installed. So here I have Nemo 1.6 installed. That's the latest release of Nemo. And you could see it that way. Of course, if you try to turn on optimization, for a module and you tell it to use Nemo and you don't have Nemo installed, Leap will tell you when you try to calculate that scenario, it will give you an error and say that Nemo is not installed. Before you do optimization modeling though, before you actually calculate a scenario and optimize it, you do need to set up some inputs. In particular, you have to turn on costs and capacities in your optimized module. And you should fill out capacity information. You should fill out cost information, all of those variables that Charlotte was just talking about in the last lecture. And fill out other performance parameters to get the optimization to work properly. And the exercise that you'll go through for optimization talks about what those prerequisites are in detail. I think, though, Actually, before I present this, I, I want to just say another word about the costs that you would use in optimization. You have Nemo 1.11 installed, so that's not the most recent version. And we would ask, yeah, we would recommend that you upgrade to version 1.6, which you can download from the website. Also, there's a question about whether there's a demo leap file to test optimization. And indeed, there is. I'll just open up that here. And you'll use this in your, it, you'll use this as a starting point for the exercise on optimization that you're going to do. But we provide a basic LEAP model that's called optimization exercise. It's delivered with LEAP and you can use that to test out optimization. So I'll, I'll do that here. It's, it has several scenarios in it. I'm just gonna calculate one scenario, which turns on optimization. This is also the scenario. exercise, but then this is also the one that is used in the exercise, right? Correct. Jason? That's right. In that scenario, I'm just going to the optimize variable here, and I'm going to turn on Nemo optimization. Now you can see actually there's an option to 
to get optimized with Nemo, or you can still optimize with Osmosis. So we still do support Osmosis for our users who are still supporting it, but you can do more with Nemo in particular, for, for example, within the Leap interface, you can model energy storage with Nemo, which is not something you can do with Osmosis. So I'm gonna to choose to optimize this with Nemo and the CBC solver. And now if I run this, this model, it should pop up a window showing me what happens in Nemo. But let me, before I do that, I'm gonna show you on the settings tab or in the settings area under optimization, there are a few different options that you can specify for optimizing with Nemo. I'll talk about a couple of these in a minute, but for the moment, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show you this, this calculations option here, it allows you to specify when Leap runs Nemo, whether you see that in a separate pop-up window or not. And if you do see it as the window minimized or not, you can also choose this option in window and pause for debugging that will run Nemo and it show you it in a window and then it will stop at the end and wait for you to press a key before it continues. So here's Nemo starting. And it ran and produced some outputs. So all of that happens for you. Here are my outputs here. I'm looking at absolute values of the energy produced by the module over time. And it's a mixture of gas and wind. Leap, all of it should be seamless for you. That's the intent. It should be easy to use. You run, you turn it on, Leap runs Nemo. It provides to Nemo all of the inputs in your model. Nemo runs, it does the optimization. Leap takes the results of the optimization and shows them to you in the results view. So let me highlight a couple of things here. When you turn on optimization for a module, you'll get a number of additional variables in the analysis view. These allow you to, to specify different constraints on the optimization, including, for example, renewable energy production targets, the minimum and maximum capacity that's allowed for different processes, or the minimum and maximum amount of capacity that can be added each year. You can have discrete addition sizes for new capacity. You can say, for example, that new wind plants always have to be added in increments of, of 500 megawatts. And you can define operating rules for storage as well. If you set up, set up storage processes, which I will show you on the next slide here. There are more of these additional variables that come in than I can cover, I think, in the lecture right now. But what I would advise you to do is to, if you have questions about any of them, and many of them are self-explanatory, but if you have questions about any of them, you can always look at the documentation or the help, the help system within Leap when you are working with your optimization model. And really, these variables that allow you to set additional constraints are the ones that you might manipulate as you're trying to calibrate your optimization model and as you're trying to arrive at a projection that you think is reasonable and plausible. I'll show you a couple of them in this model that we were just looking at as an example. So I'm within the analysis view. I'm looking at the scenario that I'm optimizing. I'm looking at the electricity generation module that I'm optimizing and I'm at the level of processes. And I can see now in addition to a number of variables that we've been looking at so far, things like efficiency and capacity, we have cost variables because this module has costs enabled under its properties. And costs are turned on for the overall model, which again is under the settings, under scope and scale, costs are turned on. So we have some cost variables. And these are variables that Charlotte talked about, like capital costs and fixed operating maintenance cost. There are also some optimization specific variables that have come up here. For example, there's this variable called maximum capacity. So this is the maximum capacity that will ever be allowed to be installed 
for each process. And by default, it's unlimited. There's no constraint on it. Or conversely, we have minimum capacity. This is the minimum amount that must be installed for each process each year. And by default, it's zero. So there's effectively no minimum. So these are some examples of the optimization specific variables that you get. Here's a variable for addition size, which says that new capacity for the or a particular process has to be added in certain increments. Because we're talking about the process level variables, I also want to highlight one other aspect of costs that was not covered in the previous lecture on costs because it's only relevant to, it's really only relevant to the to optimization modeling. And so it's about input fuels. Remember that when you just set up a, a transformation process, its input fuels are defined under the feedstock fuel folder that Leap sets up for you. And there's a new variable that Leap uses for optimization that's attached to each fuels called the fuel cost. And so this is actually, this is the place where you specify quite specifically the input fuel costs that you want to use when optimizing this module. So it's not used in the overall cost benefit analysis as, as Charlotte described, when you're doing the overall cost benefit analysis in LEAP and if you were looking at social cost results in LEAP, the costs of fuels depend on where you set the costing boundary, whether you're doing bottom-up costing and whether you have delivered costs. But when you use optimization, LEAP gives you another variable that you can use to specify the particular input costs you want to use in the optimization. And that's this, the, the fuel cost, which is at the level of feedstock fuels within your processes. And you can see here in this model, there's, a, there's an expression that just links this, feed, this feedstock fuel cost to a cost that's developed or that's specified in the resources branch. This is a typical way to do this. The reason why we provide a separate variable is that sometimes when you do optimization, you do want to represent different fuel costs that producers actually face, which might be different from the overall social costs that you're using elsewhere in your cost benefit analysis. So you might want to reflect, for example, that producers of electricity face a different tariff for natural gas that is going to affect their decisions about, about what to build and will affect this, should affect decisions about how to dispatch resources. And this additional variable allows you to do that. If you just want to link it to the overall social cost, then you can link it to something, to a social cost that's defined elsewhere in the model, for example, in the resources branch. Let me talk a little bit about modeling energy storage. This is a key feature that you can access when you're doing optimization modeling with Leap and Nemo. And what it is, is it allows you to define certain processes in your optimized module that have the ability to store energy and then to release it at a later time, like batteries, for example, or pumped hydropower storage, or really any other type of storage that you could imagine. You set this up by labeling or checking a checkbox that labels a process as a storage unit when you add the process in the model. So it's within the basic process properties. And then you, in addition to the normal variables that you should specify for the process, like efficiency, which would be the round trip efficiency for the storage and the costs of the storage, there are several storage specific variables that Leap shows you that control the dissimulation of Nemo. So they include what the starting charge is in the storage process at the beginning of the modeling period. If you want to represent, for example, that a pumped hydro power facility is half full at the start of the modeling period, you could do that. You can specify a minimum charge level, the full load hours, which, would, which relates the power capacity of a storage unit 
to its energy storage capacity. And there are different rules for energy carryover as well, which I'll just show you quickly in the interface since I think those are easiest to explain by demonstration. In order to see energy carryover rules, I first have to add a storage process. So I'm going to add one now. And I'm going to call it, I'll click storage process. That turns off feedstock fuels because it's assumed that it takes electricity from the grid or energy from that's being produced by other processes and stores it. And I'll call this batteries. The carryover rules themselves are shown in the current accounts scenario. And they are only relevant for storage processes. And there are three of them. The first is annual storage carryover. These are just yes, no variables, but they're gonna determine the extent to which energy can be transferred in time through the storage unit. So this first one says whether energy can be moved from one year to another in, in batteries. If you put, if you store some energy in batteries in 2021, can you release it in 2022? The second variable asks the same question, but, at, but about a smaller time scale, in this case, seasons. If you set up your time slices to reflect different seasonal groupings, can energy be carried over from one season to another? And then the third carryover variable is asking the same, same question, but at this point about, uh, about daily periods, if you group days into certain periods like weekdays versus weekends? Are you allowed to move storage uh, energy in a storage unit from one period to another? So these allow you to have some finer grained control over the way that storage actually operates and you can thereby distinguish between shorter term and longer term storage in your model. I'd also like to show you how you model emission costs and constraints in an optimization model with LEAP and NEMO. So remember, Charlotte already explained how externality costs can be enabled in a model. And that's by turning on, you have to be modeling, of course, externalities. So you would turn on energy effects under scope and scale. You have to be modeling costs under scope and scale in basic settings, you would turn that on. And then under the costs tab, there's an option called environmental externality costs, which Charlotte already showed, but I'll just quickly show it again. So it's this checkbox here. If you turn this on, you get a new top level branch in your model called effects. And under the effects branch, you can add pollutants and you can specify an externality cost for emissions of those pollutants. If you do this, these externality costs get taken into account in LEAP's cost benefit accounting, but they are also passed to NEMO for optimization purposes and taken into account in the cost minimization. So this is a way you can include a pollutant cost like a carbon cost in your modeling. Similarly, you can set restrictions, limits on the amount of emissions in absolute terms that can, can be permitted within the LEAP and NEMO model, or within the NEMO model, I should say. And this is enabled by, again, going into basic settings. You have to be modeling pollutant emissions. You have to have energy effects turned on in scope and scale. Then under the optimization tab, there's an option to enable emission constraints. So that is here under optimization, enable emission constraints. If you turn that on within the effects branch, you now get a second variable. So we have externality cost already, but you now get a second variable here, which is an annual emission constraint. And so you can set here the total amount of emissions that you want to be allowed in the module that you're optimizing. So this would be a way of 
in absolute terms, specifying, for example, the amount of carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide that can be permitted as a binding constraint in the optimization for electricity generation. There is another question in the chat, whether you could also show where the optimization functionalities are turned on in the process branches. I think I was just showing that. So maybe I don't understand the question. As I was saying, when you are optimizing a scenario, when you turn on optimization, you get a number of different variables. And those variables, in addition to the standard technical and cost variables, those variables control the way that processes are used in the optimization. So for example, I was showing the minimum capacity and the maximum capacity variables. Or perhaps uh, that, uh, perhaps I don't understand the question. Is there, does that answer it or are there, is there some other element that I'm not explaining? We'll watch the chat and if there's a follow-up question, please post it and I'll be sure to address that. So like in summary here, then you can model both externality costs and absolute emission constraints in your optimization. Turn it on, these options here, and you add, you specify the values that you want to use for the costs or the constraints under the effects branch. And because you're specifying those, those values as a leap expression, you're putting in a time series of values. So you can have the carbon costs change over time, like it does in this example here, where there's an expression that says, okay, the carbon cost starts out at zero, but it becomes $50 per ton by 2040 at the end of the, the simulation. I'd like to present briefly just a couple of additional advanced capabilities of NEMO mostly to, to pique your curiosity and to give you some resources you can use to follow up if you're interested. You can also follow up with Charlotte and me directly, of course. I mentioned earlier that LEAP allows you only to access a subset of what NEMO can do. And that subset also includes a subset of results. What NEMO uses, or what LEAP uses from NEMO, uses two main results from the NEMO optimization, the capacity expansion and the dispatch results from NEMO. And it reads those back into LEAP and shows them in the results view. But NEMO actually produces or can produce a whole range of other outputs as well. It can produce information about the total costs of the system. It can produce information about the, um, the way that, that energy goes into and out of storage, for example, or if you're doing transmission modeling, the way that energy flows through the transmission network. These outputs aren't shown in LEAP by default, but you can get them out of NEMO if you want to. And they can be accessed in NEMO scenario databases. So NEMO stores its data for every scenario in a database. LEAP creates the database for you when you're optimizing a scenario in LEAP. NEMO writes results into the database. And you can open those databases if you want to. You can save them and open them and access other results by doing that. The databases themselves are in an open source format called SQLite. And you can save them down to your LEAP areas repository. So the main directory where you save your model by choosing this setting under the optimization tab, there's an option called keep intermediate results. And if you turn that on, LEAP will save the scenario databases there for you. And you can then open them up with a tool that can access an SQLite database, such as DB Browser for SQLite. That's the one that we use here at SEI, and there's a link to it there. That's a freely available open source tool and a very good one. If you want to find out more about what's in a NEMO database and how to read and interpret the data, we've got links here to the relevant parts of the documentation on the structure of the database and the different outputs that you can see in the database. So it's a way of supplementing the leap reporting with additional information from the NEMO optimization for advanced users. Another option for advanced users is to include a configuration file for NEMO in your LEAP model. This allows you to turn on some options in NEMO that are not otherwise available through the LEAP interface. 
and it allows you to essentially modify Nemo's runtime settings. The way you do this is you put a configuration file called nemo.cfg in your models folder in the Leap Areas repository. So you save it with your Leap model, and then you open your Leap model and run it normally. And Nemo will pick up that configuration file at runtime and will use whatever you specify there as its runtime settings. Those runtime settings will overwrite any runtime defaults that Leap would otherwise provide to Nemo. So you can use these configuration files for several different purposes. You can specify particular solver parameters. You can tell Nemo to save additional output variables that it wouldn't otherwise save. You can run custom Julia scripts to, cust to configure or customize your model. And you can access a number of different performance tuning options. There is a section of the Nemo documentation on configuration files with some examples and all of the different options that you can specify in a file are defined there. So it's pretty easy actually to do this. You can just take a, a file, it's just a plain text file, save it as nemo.cfg and off you go. You can turn on a number of features that you wouldn't otherwise have access to through the Leap interface. One other topic for advanced users is, and this is fairly far advanced, but I, I want to make sure that it's understood that this is available, is to add a custom Nemo constraint to your model. So you can do this by, um, by writing a Julia script that defines some additional constraints. Nemo has a lot of constraints built in around different accounting, identi accounting identities, around different uh, physical restrictions within the energy system and and different rules for how demand needs to be met by supply, for example. And you can read all about them in the Nemo documentation. But if you want Nemo to do something else that it's not doing, you want it to take some other factor into account as a constraint, you could write a script that does that. You can then reference it in your Nemo configuration file, and it will be loaded and used when Nemo runs your scenario. There is a whole set of documentation on this, in, in which is linked here with examples for how to do this. And you could use custom constraints really for almost any purpose you could imagine. You could, and here, here are some of the things that we've done with custom constraints and some models that we've built so far. So for example, sharing resource limits among multiple processes or linking capacity additions or retirements across processes or having additional constraints to ensure system reliability. We've worked with utilities that of very particular requirements for how they define reliability. And it goes beyond just having a reserve margin target. So we add additional constraints to the model to reflect that. 